Hi, my name is Andrew Bryan. I'm one of the lawyers at Murphy Batista, and uh, we are a sponsor of the Personal Injury Resource Center, which is where we are now. And I thank the uh, PIRC for inviting me to come here and talk to you today about the duty to accommodate. Um, the reason it makes sense as a topic for the PRC because, is because uh, it often comes up in the context of disabilities in the workplace and so a lot of my talk today will focus on that. Uh, but before I get into those details I think it makes sense to uh, talk about where the duty to accommodate comes from um, and so that uh, you can put it into context and, and I think understanding where something comes from uh, allows you to have a better understanding of what exactly uh, it means. And so. Uh, um, I also want to make sure that uh, you uh, stop me if you have any questions and let me know if I'm speaking too quickly. Uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to interrupt me at any time. Um, now, generally speaking, uh, the duty to accommodate is, uh, is the obligation to incorporate diverse diversity. Uh, I have not included the word in the workplace here because uh, the Canadian human rights laws uh, apply to uh, the workplace, but they also apply to uh, accommodations and uh, rental accommodations and things like that, as well as services uh, such as you know going to a hospital or checking into a hotel. Uh, there are expectations that people will not be discriminated against in those settings as well. Um, and uh, the, the duty to accommodate, again broadly speaking, uh, requires uh, changes to be made, uh, changes to policies guidelines, practices, and that sort of thing, uh, as well as physical changes to, uh, to venues that, um, uh, that might have the uh, effect of discriminating against people on uh, the basis of what we call a protected characteristic. The uh, Canadian human rights legislation across the country, uh, each province has uh, their own uh, in, uh, human rights code. There's also a federal one that applies to federal employees. Um, they uh, they set out the um, the there we are. Um, they set out the the human rights laws uh, as they apply across Canada. Generally speaking, they're the same, um, and they all equally apply to, as I was mentioning, the workplace, uh, the uh, housing issues, and rental accommodations and, and services as well. Uh, they also um, delineate, as I was mentioning, the, uh, the protected characteristics. Again, generally speaking, they're the same across the country and they're, they're listed here. Uh, obviously, disability is, is, is one and a, a very important one and one that is litigated very frequently. Uh, we also uh, uh, see discrimination on the basis of race and religion, gender, sexual orientation, uh, national or ethnic origin, family or marital status, and some criminal convictions. Um, as I mentioned, uh, today we're going to focus on uh, the effect of discrimination and really the duty to accommodate in the workplace, more specifically uh, in the context of disabilities in the workplace. Uh, so after this presentation, I'm hoping that uh, you'll be able to walk away with a general understanding of some key concepts that relate to these issues. Uh, first is the set of obligations on employers uh, when it comes to the duty to accommodate. Um, there's also though limitations on the expectations of empl on employers when it comes to accommodating individuals um, and in that context we will talk about uh, the what we call the bona fide occupational requirements and undue hardship terms you may have heard of before. Uh, and finally, we'll talk about also the employee's obligations uh, in the duty to accommodate. The cases uh, often refer to the fact that this is a two-way street. Uh, employees are expected to work with their employers when coming up with solutions uh, to, to suit the accommodations uh, and, and the needs of the employee. Um, now most often the uh, need to accommodate in the workplace arises in the context of litigation and so if an employee uh, feels that they've been discriminated against uh, they will uh, usually bring a complaint uh, to the applicable human rights tribunal. Um, now that's not always the case. Sometimes you have uh, good proactive employers who identify uh, the need for an accommodation uh, for an employee without having uh, litigation looming over them and they will take steps to accommodate that employee as well. Um, 
The, uh, in, that being said, in reality, uh, the reason most of the time employers are willing to embark on that process is because if they don't, uh, they could be exposing themselves to the risk of litigation. Whatever the context is with respect to the duty to accommodate in the workplace, generally speaking the process is the same and we'll talk about that now. Um, Sorry, we won't talk about that now. We're going to talk about first about what the litigation aspect of it looks like uh, first. The, uh, if, if an employee uh, brings a complaint against their employer um, with respect to a failure to accommodate a need, in particular in this case a, a disability, the employee is expected to uh, show uh, three things. First, it seems obvious that they have a disability. Uh, second, uh, that they suffered or in the event of uh, uh, seeing a need for accommodation in the future, they, they have the risk of suffering some adverse uh, treatment uh, and there has to be a connection between the adverse treatment and the disability. The first uh, element that the employee has to prove there being a disability is usually not contentious and, if, and I think it makes sense. Uh, most disabilities are obvious. The need for a wheelchair, for example, um, that is a very common, uh, readily observable disability that would need to be accommodated in the workplace, but also in, in the services and, and accommodations as well, uh, um, or housing as well. Um, now, each of the uh, pieces of legislation across the country have a definition of what a disability is. Generally speaking, uh, there has to be some degree of permanence to the condition that is considered to be the disability. Uh, but the disability also has to have a substantial or a significant impact on that individual's ability to perform important functions. Um, and so that's how the, how the courts will view uh, whether you have a disability. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, the degree of permanence issue actually does come up and I've dealt with a case myself where that was an issue and it was a, a cardiac issue and the issue in that particular case was whether or not it had a sufficient degree of permanence as, uh, to qualify as a disability that would afford that particular employee protections under the Act. Um, the second element uh, is also not usually uh, hotly contested because it's also usually obvious. Um, it can be things as overt as the employee getting fired. It can be uh, the employee getting demoted, reducing their pay, reducing their hours, um, limiting their physical access to the workplace. Um, and I have here being unqualified for the job and the reason I, I've included that one is because it relates to um, uh, a relatively famous uh, case involving a female firefighter. Um, the, the case is called Muir and several years ago that, uh, uh, that was quite well known across Canada. It related to uh, a female forest fighter, forest firefighter who uh, worked the job successfully for a few years and uh, the government of BC that was the, technically the employer instituted uh, what they thought were some uh, reasonable baseline aerobic uh, uh, um, limits for the employees to have to qualify as for the job. They, the, the idea for the aerobic standards that the government employed uh, was safety on the job. They, they believed that uh, uh, the employees had to be able to fulfill these criteria in order to do the job safely. Unfortunately, uh, the complainant in that case wasn't able to uh, uh, fulfill that criteria and as a result she was terminated. Uh, that case was litigated all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada and for reasons relating to uh, the uh, method of coming up with the standard, it was struck and she was actually reinstated. I wanted to refer to that because I'm going to try to keep referencing that case as we go forward. While it's technically not a disability case, it was actually a discrimination on the basis of sex. The, uh, the principles uh, apply equally. Um, most battles are fought over the, the final element, and that is the question of whether the disability uh, was a factor in the treatment. Um, in the adverse treatment, of course. Um, the, the important word here for the employee is that the employee must prove that the disability was a factor. 
The employee doesn't need to prove that it's the factor, that it's the most important factor, or that it's the a driving factor. Uh, they just have to prove that it was a factor in the adverse treatment. And once the employee does all of that, then it turns to the employer to justify their actions, to justify the standard. Um, and they can do that by uh, uh, showing that it is a bona fide occupational requirement, which I will explain. Um, the, it's a relatively complex analysis that, that uh, the, the employer has to undertake uh, in, in, in establishing that they have a bona fide occupational requirement defense. The first element that they have to prove is that the standard or the job duty that's in question uh, was adopted for a purpose that is rationally connected to the job. So uh, with respect to that, we're looking at what's the purpose for that standard. What is that standard trying to achieve? Is it trying to achieve safety, efficiency? Perhaps in the female firefighter case, it's both. Um, the, the, the minimal uh, aerobic standard is maybe a safety issue, it may be an efficiency issue, so you can just, they can try to justify it on that basis. Um, the uh, standard also needs to have been adopted in good faith, so the question here is did the employer have an honest belief that the standard was necessary to achieve the intended purpose? And again, re referencing the, uh, the aerobic standard, um, they undertook actually fairly extensive scientific research at, I believe it was the University of Victoria, to come up with this standard. Um, and, and so the court was taken through all of that evidence so that the employer attempted to show that it was a good faith uh, decision that they undertook to implement that standard. But of course, if the standard is implemented with the purpose of discriminating against an individual or a group of individuals, it's going to be struck on that basis. So, uh, and then finally, the, the last question is whether the standard is reasonably necessary to accomplish the purpose. And so here we're looking at whether, uh, and this is where the duty to accommodate really comes in, we're looking at whether it would be impossible to accommodate the employee or the group of employees without imposing undue hardship on the employer. Um, the, again, the operative word here is undue hardship. The courts recognize that uh, some hardship is acceptable and expected. Sometimes things aren't going to be great for employers and that's going to be okay as long as it doesn't get to the point of it being undue and we will, we will get into that. Um, but I think before we, we talk about uh, how, how an accommodation reaches the point of undue hardship, it makes sense to talk about how the accommodation process actually works. Um, what process do, you, do the employers have to go through to get to that point? Generally speaking, the, the uh, three steps that the employer has to undertake at this point is to determine what barriers there are uh, that affect the employee or the group of employees. Um, usually that's obvious and usually that's brought to their attention by the employee in the, in the form of a complaint. Um, then they have to explore options for removing those barriers and then, if possible, they accommodate the employee implementing the removal of those barriers. Um, there are many examples of, uh, uh, of how accommodation can be achieved in the workplace and of course what accommodations are necessary uh, really depend on what sort of disability or limit the employee has. Um, so here we're, we, we, we have some examples of modifying the physical environment. And so again, the wheelchair example is, a, is a, a, an easy one. Um, sometimes there might be a need to increase the space between cubicles or within cubicles to accommodate somebody's wheelchair. Um, it can be things as simple as uh, making sure that somebody's desk setup is ergonomically sound to avoid repetitive strain injuries like carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and it can also be getting specialized computer equipment for the visually impaired. Um, modifying terms and conditions uh, of, of employment, of course, also comes into play. Um, an example I had earlier in the slide that I hadn't mentioned is, is the example of a, a customer greeter. And if the employer requires the greeter to stand when greeting new customers, they are discriminating against people who can't stand, people in wheelchairs. And so maybe the employer has to look at changing that policy, or if not, uh, they can provide a, a specialized wheelchair for that particular employee, as an example. 
Um, there are also temporary assignments. If somebody has hip surgery and they're unable to lift a certain amount for a certain period of time, uh, those accommodations can be made quite readily as well. Uh, pregnancy is another good example. Uh, uh, perhaps um, a, a pregnant woman works in some sort of factory where they are unable to, uh, or they'd be putting the baby at risk by breathing in certain chemicals, they would be given a temporary reassignment for the duration of the pregnancy. Um, leave of absence is another form of accommodation, so just allowing the employee to essentially take time off uh, that may be paid or unpaid depending on the contract. Um, and uh, finally, and unfortunately, uh, for employees, uh, it sometimes um, demotions uh, are necessary and uh, there are many cases out there that have allowed demotions to as a form of accommodation um, and, and employees can be required to accept a lower level of pay to match the, the lower position as well. Um, yes, question? What is demotion? Oh, demotion uh, involves uh, essentially um, having a, an employee at a certain level uh, and, and changing their job so that it's a lower level on the, on the uh, ladder, I suppose. Uh, so if you're, if you're an executive and you get demoted down to uh, a, a mid-level manager or something like that, that would be a demotion. Um, and so uh, with respect to these accommodation options, uh, or, or as the employer is going through um, determining what options they have to accommodate, if there are multiple options, again, there's a hierarchy of things to consider here. Uh, we want to maximize the employee's dignity and privacy. Uh, you want to minimize their discomfort. Uh, and you also uh, want to be able to address their needs as quickly as possible. And that works both for the employee and the employer. It's not doing the employer any good to have an employee unable to do their job. Uh, and the employee wants to be able to get back to work as well. Um, much of the focus is, has been on what the employer is expected to do in the, uh, in the accommodation process. But as I mentioned earlier, it is a two-way street. Employees have an obligation to participate and cooperate and essentially be reasonable. Um, they have to uh, provide sufficient medical information to justify the need for the accommodation. Um, one of the uh, uh, questions that often arises in these cases uh, is the extent of detail uh, the employee needs to provide their employer about the uh, I guess the, the medical reason for the need to accommodate. Um, employers are not entitled to know exactly what the condition is. Really the employer is entitled to know what the functional limitations are as a result of the condition. So if you are getting your doctor to provide your employer a note uh, to support a change in the workplace, it just needs to support the, the idea that you need some accommodations. It doesn't need to tell the employer why. Um, as it says up there, of course, you have to act reasonably and cooperate uh, in search for reasonable uh, accommodations. And I think this is important because the employee should, uh, should um, enjoy the opportunity to uh, work out these um, possibilities with their employer and have some input there because they may have some preferences uh, that the employer should take into account. Um, and, and of course, uh, the employee cannot expect perfect solutions. There are going to be times when both sides are going to have to compromise and, and, uh, and sometimes uh, both sides might be uh, unhappy uh, with the result, but sometimes that's the way it's just going to be. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a demotion can result in the employee having to accept a lower level of pay. It seems drastic, but if that's really the only accommodation option that's available, then that might be the one that the employee has to accept. Um, if the employee doesn't accept a reasonable accommodation, then the employer will be considered to have discharged their duty to accommodate and, uh, and, and they will be free from liability or complaint uh, if the employee uh, takes that route. Um, there are limits on the employer's uh, obligation to accommodate and this relates to the concept of undue hardship I mentioned earlier. Uh, the law, you may have heard the term uh, that uh, employers have to accommodate to the point of undue hardship. 
That's not exactly correct. It's 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 short of undue hardship. Uh, they don't need to take it to undue hardship. Uh, they just have to show that they would uh, experience undue hardship if they were to take those added steps. Um, and uh, and when we're considering what undue hardship can mean, we look at uh, the effect the accommodations will have on the employer's operations, on their business, sometimes on their bottom line, uh, and so sort of relating to the expense uh, that the accommodations might uh, incur. And this is quite uh, a contentious part of most of these cases when they're litigated, um, because. You'll, you'll often hear the term that they, these cases and these issues in particular are decided on a case-by-case -case basis. That is very much the case when it comes to determining whether an employer uh, is approaching the point of undue hardship when they're accommodating an employee because the circumstances of that particular employer will very much dictate or guide what will be considered undue hardship. If you compare uh, a giant multinational corporation with a mom and pop corner store, uh, the uh, the expectations on the steps that they're going to be required to take are going to be very different because their ability to um, interchange employees from one job to another, uh, for one employee to step in the, to the place of another employee is going to be limited, but also their ability to afford these uh, certain accommodation measures is going to be limited compared to a, a large corporation. Um, this is this list here is not uh, is not ex exhaustive. There are many many considerations uh, that would apply. Um, the employer's obligations are also not limitless in terms of the time uh, these accommodations uh, need to be in place and of course uh, that will depend on what accommodations we're talking about in, in a given case. But for example, if you take a look at a situation where an employee needs a temporary leave of absence uh, and it becomes indefinite um, to the point where the employer needs to replace that employee because they need somebody to come in and do the job. If that employer is having difficulty finding somebody to take that job because it's not being offered as a permanent position, then that could trigger the end of their uh, obligation to keep accommodating that particular issue. Um, as we have here, the employee skills might become outdated uh, if it goes on too long, uh, and, and the business may focus or may have new focuses as well that will impact the decision. Um, generally speaking, and, and, and as difficult as it is to, to generalize this issue, because as I was saying, it is very much determined on a case by case basis. These are the sorts of questions that the courts will expect or the tribunals will expect the employers to think about and that the courts will think about when they're going through this analysis. Have the employers, uh, did the employer investigate all alternative approaches um, that do not have a discriminatory effect? If, uh, they, if, if alternative standards or approaches are found to be capable of fulfilling the purpose of the standard that's in question, then the court's going to want to know why those alternative standards weren't implemented. Um, is it is necessary that all of the employees meet a single standard, or can you change the standards depending on the employee and the type of work that they're doing? Um, can the job be done in a way that's less discriminatory? And I think importantly, uh, and this references back to the employee's obligations, uh, have the other parties, such as the employee or the union, uh, assisted in the search for these alternatives? If the if the employee and or the union, if there if there is one, don't participate in that process, then that's going to make it easier for the uh, employer to to show that they've taken the steps necessary um, to accommodate if if they have been unable to find a reasonable solution. Um, now the bottom line is uh, to, to again try to break it down as simply as you can in, the, in a case that in, 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 sorry, in an area that is very fact driven. Um, essentially if, if the employer can make accommodations work uh, short of undue hardship then the employer will be expected to make those changes. If the employer cannot make those accommodations short of undue hardship then they will not be required to make them. They will be considered to have discharged their obligation. Um, it's usually in everyone's best interest, the employee's best interest and the employer's best interest to collaborate and work together to come up with solutions. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, the employers don't want empl an employee uh, unable to work for an extended period of time when they value that employee and they want 
the work that that employee provides them. Uh, and uh, compromise is inevitable, and so that's something that you'd have to prepare for if you're embarking on this process. Thank you. Any questions? I have one. Okay. Take you back to the, uh, the note from the doctor. Mm -hmm. It's a practical matter. Does it make sense for an employee who's seeking accommodation to actually go and get their own independent medical examination, or should they just get a doctor's note? Because often physicians don't know exactly what they should be putting in this. Yeah, generally, generally speaking, uh, a visit, like their family doctor's note will be sufficient. Um, if they go to their family doctor, making a normal, make a normal appointment, talk to the doctor about what their needs are, uh, saying that uh, you know I, I, I need to rest because my, my knee is sore. The doctor will do whatever assessment they need to do. Um, then, uh, then they will write a note if you ask them to write a note for the employer to be able to take some time off work. That's not really an accommodation issue because. It's probably not as uh, long term as a disability would be required uh, to trigger the human rights laws. But the, the, the point is, is that, generally speaking, family doctors are pretty good about providing that information. I, don't, uh, I haven't seen a case myself where an employee has been required to go get an independent uh, full exam from an independent doctor. The GP is usually good. I'm not sure if I was answering your question. It's sort of. Is it, I can't remember, is it, is it physiatrists that talk, that does the assessment with your basic your physical limitations in the workplace, like whether you can lift your arms over your head and all that? Yeah, so there, there's a physiatrist that will do that. Um, they, they do that. And there's also functional capacity evaluators. They're not doctors. Um, and they're usually used in the litigation context. Uh, physiatrists can, can do the same in terms of um, they can provide a prognosis and things like that. So that's, they're, they're good sources for determining how long uh, a limitation or a condition may last. If it's permanent. I'm just trying to think of ways to short circuit having to, to do the chicken dance and go back and forth. So if you went directly to a functional capacity evaluator, I mean, do, they, do you need a referral to go? To a functional capacity evaluator? Yeah. Um, I'd probably not. You could probably refer yourself or get your doctor to, to send you, um, which would be your referral. I'm not sure about. Um, obviously, you're not going to put this on the video. Um, <laughs> I've always oh, no. had to get referral for, for, for everything. For, but for a functional capacity evaluation, because the only time I ever deal with those is in the context of a case. Right. Like and so we care. send them as an expert, because we use them as experts. Um, but, uh, but I'm wondering if it makes some sense to, to have people thinking about that in advance as a way to short circuit the litigation process. Like if you put that in front of an employer and an employer's counsel right, at, right from the get-go, mm -hmm. the counsel sees, okay, this person has limitations, it's not worth taking this forward, let's sit down and talk about it. Yeah, I mean, it would be, it would be strengthening what you're getting from your family doctor. Um, I mean, the, the, the effect would be the same, I think. They, they might, if you're getting a, a, a full assessment from a physiatrist, it might hold a bit more sway uh, down the road. Um, but I think that would probably be taking it a bit further than, the, than you would need to uh, in this context if, prior to litigation. Um, but in litigation, that might become necessary to show what your limitations really are. Yeah. I have a question about this. I have two questions. One of them is, um, you were talking about the physical disability. There are some physical disability that is visible, some of them are not, mm -hmm. uh, even the patient or the disabled uh, cannot show anything of the disability. If there is a pain, you cannot show the pain. Yeah. So how is it? Where is it? Even sometimes it's difficult to pinpoint where is the pain is coming from. It can go all over the place, but it can move from somewhere to another place, from left side to right side. It's a lot. So this is difficult to. Uh, this is one of the situations I want to talk about. It. At some time, uh, it is not physical. It could be mental. Mm -hmm. or it could be some another type of disability, or. It could be physical disability, but by being, uh, by having a physical disability, a mental disability, like a kind of depression, a mm -hmm. kick in, yeah. and it starts to drain the person uh, of the, even the social life, the, the work, it's going to affect the work and the personal life as well. Mm -hmm. it, it has an effect on many things. So it's going to take the person to disability. And, 
more deceptive to be that person while this person is not understood and it's not trusted. Oh, maybe this person is lazy. And what's in it? You yeah. don't want it. Oh, you know, everything we uh, provide him or her doesn't want to take it. It has always excuse for anything. So, what, what are the situations? We see that every day. Um, and particular situations relating to pain or, or psychological, you said disabilities, I would call it a psychological condition or something, um, but we definitely see this every day. Um, and uh, as, as we were talking about earlier, the physiatrist, the functional capacity evaluator, the GP, um, they're trained to be able to assess those conditions. Um, pain is not always seen, absolutely, it's often not. Uh, in terms of it's not obvious where it's coming from or why you have it. Um, but doctors can generally assess for that and when they, when they can, uh, they can provide uh, the employer the information they need uh, to trigger the need for accommodations if that's what's, if that's what's happening. Um, and the same thing with psychological conditions as well. Um, I, I didn't reference it earlier, but the, uh, one of the examples I had about how, uh, how some um, limitations are difficult to see, some disabilities are difficult to see, and uh, the example I had was a learning disability. That's something that you can't see. Uh, chances are the employee would have to bring it to the employer's attention to do something about it. Uh, and, but, you know, they happen and learning disabilities can be diagnosed. Uh, if that's what's required, and so you can get that medical um, justification for for those accommodations in those circumstances. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Neuropsychological testing. I mean, of course. I mean, like I was saying, all these cases are very, very fact-driven, and so what justification you need to present uh, is going to depend on what condition you're dealing with, and so um, it, it can be all of these things. Any of these things. So, if people have questions about this, what should they do? <laughs> if you have any questions about the uh, the duty to accommodate just discussed, uh, my contact details are up here. You can uh, contact us at any time, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. I'm sorry, I was going to ask. What was I going to ask? Um, oh, it, do do people often hire or Because there's with the personal injury, you know, there's a lot of it's financially. But with something like this, is, is it really difficult to get a lawyer for human rights sort of thing? Uh, no, it's just a different model. Um, the I don't I don't know how the because you're basically going for an employment lawyer uh, when you're dealing with a human rights complaint in the workplace, dealing with a, a, an accommodation problem, um, and so there are employment firms out there that, that, that do this work every day, like we do with with the personal injury. Uh, work. Um, I don't know how they how they structure their payments. I know some will do on the hour, some will do on a contingency uh, fee basis. It depends on the case, I imagine. Um, but no, there's a whole legal industry out there that, that, that does this work. So, so who, who pays for that? So is it the employee has to pay for that, or an employer, or is it any organization that can? Yeah, it depends. It depends on um, it depends on the agreement that employee comes up with with, with their lawyer. Um, if if you're successful, um, then the, uh, the 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 losing party will pay at least some of it uh, in terms of the costs and, and that sort of thing. But um, the fees and uh, whatever fees you pay your lawyer and usually is paid by the employee. Situations where the employer would, would, would pay that bill. So, does working with TISA take these cases on contingency or are they push on a digital hour? Just don't know. Well, the, I, I think we only do things on contingency um, or pro bono, yeah. Um, I'm not sure, and does anybody do this work? And Lena does. <laughs> oh, does she do yeah. duty to accommodate fights yeah. with employers? Sorry, who's that? Lena. 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 Oh, oh okay. okay. Actually, she was anyway. Okay. Um, oh yes, that's right. She does the human rights. Mm -hmm. That's right. Oh, does she? Okay, I didn't issue, know that. I guess the other question to ask is about venue because I guess there's three potential venues, right? If you're a unionized employee, mm -hmm. you're going through the grievance process. Right. Uh, and if you are uh, not, then you bring a complaint at the human rights tribunal, or um, you can. Uh, 
you can sue in the Supreme Court. Um, but won't they just send you to the New Mexico? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, but we can answer that in Yeah. I can't remember. It's the problem when I don't practice it. <laughs> um, Let's phone Lena. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why isn't she doing this one? You mentioned the book Oh, sorry, yeah, so a contingency fee agreement that, that a, a client would have with their lawyer essentially is um, an agreement that the lawyer only gets paid a certain percentage of the uh, award that's either um, obtained by way of a settlement or a judgment. And so essentially the client only pays if they get something at the end of the day. And so, if, so the lawyer takes on the risk, if they lose, they don't get paid their fees. Um, if they win, then they get paid a percentage of what of what is obtained by way of a settlement or a judgment. Let's talk about the settlement or judgment just for a minute. So, what is the employee going to get out of this? Let's assume we're not talking about the unionized context. Mm -hmm. um, are you talking about a monetary award plus the ability to get back to work? Usually, um, usually they don't both happen. I believe um, reinstatement is a difficult uh, is a is a difficult one for the employee to get because normally by the time it gets to the point where you're litigating it at the tribunal or the courts or whatever, that relationship is sour to the point where it's not reconcilable. And so there's not going to be uh, reasonably there's not going to be an option on the table for that employee to go back to the job. And so then you're looking at uh, a monetary award. Um, and and uh, essentially in, in human rights in the human rights context, uh, it can be lost wages. Uh, so if, if the uh, if the tribunal finds that the employee was wrongfully terminated or discriminated against and terminated, uh, then they would be entitled to recover the wages they should have earned. Um, and they would also get what's colloquially known as a, a, a hurt feelings award. Um, it's kind of like the human rights context pain and suffering or general damages award. Um, the, the numbers aren't that high uh, for that aspect. I mean, they kind of used to hover around 5,000 or so dollars. Now they're up to 20, maybe 25. In really bad cases, they might get a bit uh, higher than that. Um, there might be punitive damages type award as well, where you can get um, a higher award on top of that. But um, but generally, you're not going to get reinstatement in that in that context. Reinstatement comes into play more often in the union grievance process because then employers have to send the employee back to work. So that's why it makes sense to talk about uh, taking a case like this on contingency, which is actually a, a paycheck at the end of it for everybody. Potentially, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So it could it could work out that way.